for uh, this uh, system, which is also referred to as uh, isomorphous uh, system, uh, is uh, the copper nickel system. So again, uh, the composition axis is in terms of weight fraction, and we also noted this error in this diagram. The top axis here is uh, in mole fraction or uh, atomic uh, fraction, atomic percent uh, nickel, and uh, these two things cannot be the same because the atomic weights are different, but uh, we will ignore that. Uh, Callister is known to contain uh, mistakes, and this must be one of them. All right, so let's uh, just get on with this. Um, so complete miscibility in the solid state as well as in the liquid state. And uh, then we get this uh, region, a lens shaped region in the phase diagram where two phases are in equilibrium. And uh, then we post, well, the top curve is called uh, the liquidus and it separates the liquid from the two phase region. And the bottom curve here is called the solidus and uh, that separates the solid the single phase region from the two phase alpha plus uh, liquid uh, region. And the main point here is that if you take any alloy, such as uh, something with the 40% uh, nickel, it uh, you can see that it melts over a range of uh, temperatures. And uh, so that range for 40%, I think, is from something like 1225 degrees Celsius to um, 1275 degrees Celsius. So, <clears throat> OK, so again, focusing on one region somewhere around, I mean, alloys containing uh, 20 to 50 percent uh, uh, of nickel. So if you focus on on the liquid plus solid region, if you take this alloy and the alloy here is noted with the C sub zero and uh, from the scale, we see that it is about 35 percent nickel. If you take it to this temperature, which is at what, 1250? degrees Celsius, then you realize that it is obviously in the two phase region. And uh, so uh, the two phases alpha and liquid, do they have the same composition as the original alloy, alloy itself? And the answer is no. And uh, treat this as a procedural knowledge right now, but we will uh, justify it later in one of the annexures that I will send across. There is a firm thermodynamic basis for uh, why this must be so. And uh, just to treat this as, as, uh, as something where you simply use this uh, process for determining the, uh, the compositions of the phases. So what you do is uh, draw a tie line at that uh, temperature. Tie line is this line segment at this horizontal line segment at 1250 degrees uh, Celsius at the temperature of relevance here. Uh, and it extends from one um, phase boundary to the other phase boundary, uh, straddling a two-phase uh, region. And uh, then the solid composition is uh, given by this uh, C alpha, given by the solidus uh, curve, and the liquid composition is given by the liquidus uh, uh, curve. And this is generalizable to any other situation as well, even for situations where the two relevant phases are uh, both liquids or both solids. So this is a fairly general feature of uh, phase diagrams. So this is where we stopped last time. So let's um, pick up uh, from this. All right, the first thing, I mean, this came up uh, during the Q&A last time. And uh, yeah. So um, this was uh, regarding uh, Gibbs phase rule. Um, so because we are dealing with a binary system, the number of components has uh, become two, but at the same time we are dealing with uh, a system in which we have only solid uh, and uh, liquid phases. And uh, we know that uh, pressure is not an important variable in, in such situations. And in any case, the binary phase diagram itself is drawn for one particular pressure. So we know that this uh, two in Gibbs phase rule comes from um, temperature and pressure since the pressure is held constant or pressure does not have a great deal of uh, effect on on these phase diagrams. So we modify this uh, uh, Gibbs phase rule for the so-called condensed systems, that is systems with uh, uh, no uh, gaseous or vapor uh, phase. And therefore, this is the modified uh, Gibbs phase rule. So C has gone up to two now and uh, therefore, 
uh, you get uh, two degrees of freedom when the system has just one phase in equilibrium. And of course, one degree of freedom when it has two phases in equilibrium. And then finally, a zero degrees of freedom when it has three phases at equilibrium, which we will come to towards the end of uh, this class. All right, let's see how this works out. So if you are in the single phase region here, um, solid phase or the liquid phase, then the two um, uh, degrees of freedom basically imply that you can change. By the way, uh, see, because it is a single phase, it must have the same composition as the original alloy composition itself. So for example, if you take something with a composition of 40%, and if you take it to some location like this, um, below the solidus, then it, it is in the form of a single phase and its composition cannot be different from the original alloy composition that you have taken. So uh, the two degrees of freedom basically imply that you can change the composition of that single phase one way or the other, or you can change the temperature one way or the other, and you will still remain in the two phase region. Uh, sorry, single phase region of the phase diagram. All right. So let's see how this works out uh, for uh, the two phase field. Now, we have already mentioned that uh, if uh, the alloy finds itself in a two phase uh, region of the phase diagram, then uh, it, the compositions of the two phases are given by the phase boundaries that lie at the end of the tie line. Um, tie line is basically the temperature horizontal and it's only a line segment. It is not the entire line. It is only the line segment between the phase boundaries. So the relevant variables here are the temperature and the compositions of the two phases. And uh, so if uh, F equals one, that implies that you can choose one of them and the other two get automatically fixed. And we have already seen if you choose a temperature, then the other two are automatically fixed. The solidus uh, composition, uh, solidus composition gives you the solid, uh, um, the uh, the percentage of nickel in the solid in, and of course the liquidus uh, end of the tie line gives you the composition of the liquid. You can also change the argument around. Suppose you want to fix the solid composition at some value. And in this figure, let's choose something that is convenient, which is already marked here. Suppose we choose the solid composition to be this uh, C alpha. And from the figure, it appears to be like 43% or so. So let's choose the solid composition to be 43%. And that implies that the solid is here. And once that is chosen, for a two-phase region, then the other things are automatically chosen. The temperature is chosen because of this intersection of the composition vertical with the solidus. That fixes the temperature, and the composition of the liquid is uh, uh, fixed by the uh, the tie line end that uh, intersects with um, uh, the liquidus. So uh, it's it's fairly straightforward, and this is how it it works. Uh, the bottom line is that the alloy composition itself is not the relevant variable here. And if you choose the alloy composition as your variable, then uh, you sort of go a little crazy here. Because if you say that, okay, this region is a two dimensional region, and I seem to be able to change the alloy composition one way or the other and, and so on. But that is not the um, the uh, uh, relevant variable here. The When we talk about two phases, the composition of each phase then becomes the relevant variable as well as the temperature. And of course, you could get three phases in equilibrium, but it is not there in a particular phase diagram. We will get to the UTEC take uh, a little later. All right, so here is a, a quick uh, introduction to something called lever rule. Uh, if I pose the problem as uh, the lever rule problem, then uh, I mean, many people have difficulty somehow getting their minds um, Around around this, so but uh, I'll start with an, uh, a simpler uh, uh, problem, which is the average composition. So this kind of stuff is something that you would have done back in uh, uh, class nine, ten, and, and so on. So if you start with uh, some solution A, some solution B with the different compositions, and if the amounts of those solutions are also given, then uh, you mix them, you get a new solution. What is the average composition of this? Uh, this uh, new solution. And it's fairly straightforward. You just use mass balance. The total weight of sugar is conserved. And therefore, total weight of sugar in the final solution here is uh, 
the the uh, second rather the the new solution is, is this and the amount of solution uh, sugar that came from the first solution is here and the amount of sugar that came from the second solution is here just add them up and equate it to the amount of sugar in the uh, new solution okay here's the deal this sort of stuff is also valid as long as we are talking about average composition uh, then um, even if the two starting solutions are not miscible, for example, let's say you have uh, sugar and oil. I don't know whether they mix or not, or whether sugar dissolves in oil or not. I presume it does. Uh, and uh, let's say uh, so much of uh, uh, sugar and water solution. So this sort of uh, equation would be valid there as well. The reverse problem is, is what we deal with uh, um, in the case of uh, lever rule. So given an average composition, Right, and uh, given the compositions of the um, of one phase and the other phase, and in the context of the previous uh, problem, one solution and the other solution, then you can ask this question: What is the amount of uh, the original solutions that you took? And so, if we define the phase fraction in this particular case, the share of the first solution, share of the second solution, etc. Um, but in the context of a phase diagram, they would be called phase fractions. So, so many grams of that phase as opposed to so many grams of the other phase, etc. And then the same thing works. You just divide through by W1 plus W2, little W1 and little W2. And in terms of these uh, phase fractions, uh, you get this. And of course, the phase fractions now, since they are fractions, they must add up to one. And uh, we can rearrange this to get this. I mean, it's it's actually quite amazing how many people actually get this wrong in a practical situation. Um, so it's it's worth spending some time on this. It is called the lever rule. Here's a cartoon um, because uh, uh, imagine some sort of a lever and you're putting some weight at this end as opposed to the other end and you want to balance these things out. So the weight at the end of the longer arm can be smaller than the weight at the end of the um, um, the shorter arm and then still have it uh, balanced. And that means the side which has a lower, uh, smaller uh, arm, shorter arm, uh, that fraction, phase fraction is higher. And this is basically what you have here. So in addition, the phase diagrams not only give you the uh, compositions of the liquid and solid phases in a two phase uh, situation. It also gives you how much of each phase must be present if it is uh, at equilibrium. So in the context of the figure that we have already seen, so here is 35% and here's the uh, liquid composition. Here is the solid composition. Since the overall alloy composition is closer to the liquid composition, you have the liquid fraction to be higher. Liquid fraction is, is fairly uh, simple to visualize. Suppose you equilibrate it uh, at this temperature, then you have liquid and solid, and typically the liquid uh, being lighter, uh, it would uh, uh, sort of go to the top and then the solids would sink to the bottom. So you can decant the liquid and you can weigh it. And that is basically what we mean by liquid fraction and solid fraction in, in the context of phase diagrams. So all right, this is fairly simple and straightforward. And uh, this is only a side note, even though we started with some five variables, there are two constraints. I'm just uh, making a connection with the Gibbs phase rule type situation here. And that means there are only three relevant variables, independent variables. If they are all fixed, everything else is automatically fixed as well in uh, this. And that is how we end up with uh, the fourth quantity here, which is uh, the weight fraction, the phase fraction of uh, liquid. All right, so um, let's uh, look at uh, the uh, consequences of the phase diagram uh, when you start uh, with a liquid alloy. So again, some 35% uh, composition. You melt it completely, and what you have is a single liquid phase with the same composition, 35%. And now you're cooling it, and uh, and of course, you are maintaining equilibrium at every uh, step uh, here. 
and the first solid starts to appear when the temperature hits the liquidus. But the first solid that appears has this composition here. And uh, OK, according to this figure, it is about 46 percent uh, um, nickel. And as you go down to lower and lower temperatures, uh, you get uh, um, more and more of the solid um, and uh, and the solid composition keeps moving along this uh, along the solidus and the liquid composition also moves along the liquidus as you keep going down to lower and lower temperature. And of course, here is another error here. So under equilibrium cooling conditions, you hit the um, solidus temperature. This should be completely alpha. So, but here he still has, uh, Callister still has some liquid uh, in there, but that's okay. Uh, but you cool it down further and, and uh, what you end up with is a polycrystalline mixture of uh, alpha. It is polycrystalline because alpha, the first solid uh, uh, that appears, it appears in the form of multiple nuclei. So nucleation is something that we have not seen so far, but uh, you can imagine solid coming out of the liquid at the multiple locations. And of course, there is no earthly reason why they must all have the same orientation. So as they grow, become bigger and bigger, and eventually they impinge, they end up producing um, a polycrystalline aggregate with, uh, with the grain boundaries separating the original uh, grains. All right. But here's the situation. So this equilibrium cooling basically implies that uh, you are uh, not only equilibrating the temperature, but you're also equilibrating the chemical compositions in the sense that the um, solid composition keeps moving along this direction. And the liquid composition keeps moving along that direction. And since the composition of the liquid and composition of alpha are different from the original alloy composition, in other words, the liquid is richer in composite, I mean copper and uh, alpha is richer in nickel. This requires diffusion of these elements in both the liquid solution and the solid solution. And diffusion is a horribly slow process. Uh, we will see another example coming up just um, now in, in a couple of slides. And uh, but equilibrium cooling basically assumes equilibrium at every intermediate state. And it basically implies that uh, the <clears throat> diffusion is extremely fast or the cooling rate is extremely small or rather extremely infinitesimally slow cooling. So that is effectively you are giving enough time for uh, composition equilibration to happen. OK, so. If you uh, under normal circumstances, this is usually not the case. Diffusion is slow, especially in the solid phase. And in fact, uh, this is a, a known fact that diffusion is orders of magnitude slower in the solid phase than in the liquid phase, uh, at least four orders of magnitude. And as you come down to lower and lower temperatures, uh, it typically becomes, uh, that difference becomes even bigger. So if you assume infinite, infinitely fast liquid phase diffusion, that is equilibration, composition equi equilibration is very fast in, in the liquid then you can very easily see the consequences here. The first solid comes out with that composition. The layers that form as you keep coming down into lower and lower temperatures, additional layers that form, they are, they have smaller and um, smaller content, nickel content. And uh, that's because the, uh, the um, solid composition that is formed, every layer that forms a new uh, has to, follow the, um, it depends on the liquid that is uh, surrounding the material. And uh, since the liquid composition itself is moving that way, the new solids that form, they keep moving along this direction. And if you do the mass balance again, you will realize that the solid, the average composition of this solid here would follow this uh, dashed line. But that's beside the point here. The broader point is that in the final material, the, you end up with the composition differences. The core of the grain has a higher nickel content than the periphery of, uh, of the grains. And uh, well, this is something if you want it, that's great. But if you don't want it, then you will have to do something to equilibrate the composition uh, 
um, later. That is, uh, you will have to take it to some very high temperature, hold it there for a very long time, and, uh, and then let the composition become equal everywhere. Okay, here's a pretty nice picture that uh, Callister presents, and this is uh, from a bronze alloy. And obviously, it must have uh, lots of uh, other components other than uh, uh, copper and tin. And uh, again, it's from 19th century BC, and that's uh, pretty interesting. And the variation in color is uh, because of the composition variation. The micrograph, I mean, in the uh, book, he says it's about 30x. And since this is magnified, I mean, I, I say that uh, it is approximately each side is about one millimeter of the alloy by one millimeter as observed under the microscope. But here's the thing, solid state diffusion is so small at uh, room temperature that uh, nearly, I mean, 4,000 years um, of this alloy sitting at room temperature or, or even lower, hasn't done anything at all to equilibrate the composition across the grains. All right, so this is uh, the last topic that we want to see um, today. So uh, here's a situation where we have three phases that can coexist at equilibrium. And uh, this is uh, this feature here is called a eutectic. So this phase diagram itself is uh, copper and and uh, and silver. So here you can see the weight percent axis here, which is uh, whose graduations are all uh, at equal distances. They do not correspond to uh, the uh, the markers here in terms of atomic percent uh, uh, silver. So. This has been drawn correctly. Um, and <clears throat> so one of the main things that you see here is that the, there are two sets of solidus and liquidus curves. Here's one solidus and one liquidus from starting from the copper end. And here is another uh, liquidus and another solidus uh, starting from the um, silver end. And the liquidus curves, they intersect at this point. And uh, so the temperature and composition corresponding to those are called eutectic temperature and uh, eutectic alloy composition. And uh, so let's look at the other features. The eutectic alloy, right? If you take this eutectic alloy and then start from the liquid, then it would solidify at this temperature according to the phase diagram at one temperature. In other words, it solidifies like a pure metal but unlike a pure metal, this alloy would produce not a single phase, uh, but two phases. Uh, the two phases are uh, the alpha with this composition and beta with that composition. So that is given here. And it is given in the form of something which looks like a chemical equilibrium. And so at equilibrium, it basically means that liquid with this composition can be in equilibrium with the alpha of this composition and beta of this composition at the eutectic temperature, which is uh, 779 uh, degrees Celsius. Okay, so these three phases are at equilibrium at the eutectic temperature. Okay, but you can also choose off eutectic alloys. And so if you take an alloy with, uh, let us say, 40% uh, silver, and start from the liquid. So uh, the first solid starts to form when you cross the liquidus here. And as you come down to lower and lower temperatures, the situation is exactly the same as what we have seen in the isomorphous case. Uh, more and more of the solid will form. And as more and more of the solid forms, the liquid composition moves along the liquidus curve. And when you hit, when this alloy hits the eutectic temperature, there is still some liquid that is left with the eutectic composition. So that will produce alpha and beta. And of course, the alpha and beta that are produced would also be uh, having the same compositions as uh, we have already described. 8% uh, for alpha and 91.2% for uh, beta and, and so on. So the bottom line is that at TE, all the alloys starting from here to there um, could have three phases in equilibrium, 
and uh, their compositions are obviously fixed at these values. Okay, this should be C sub L. I will change it and, and repost uh, this. Okay, some more features. So below the eutectic temperature, you have alpha and beta uh, being stable for all these alloys. And uh, there is this feature that you see here, and it separates one solid phase region from the two solid phase uh, region of the phase diagram. And that feature is called a solvus, sort of similar to the liquidus and, and, uh, and solidus, but this represents something uh, slightly different. And uh, this uh, represents the limit of solubility. That is, at some temperatures such as 700 degrees Celsius, about 5% of silver can go into a solid solution in copper, but not more. If you put, if you try to put more, um, it would. Uh, the average composition keeps going up and it will take you into the two phase region and so on. So it uh, basically represents a limit of uh, solubility. And the positive slope here also implies that at 800, you can sort of uh, near 800, not 800, 779 degrees Celsius, you can dissolve up to 8% uh, uh, silver, but you cool it down to 400. Effectively, there is very little silver left in the um, uh, solid solution. And that means the remaining silver will have to precipitate out, just like the case of water and sugar solution that we discussed earlier. So uh, we end up with uh, uh, the possibility of diffusion, I mean uh, precipitation. We will look at precipitation uh, a little later when we talk about uh, phase transformations. Okay, now um, for the first time we are encountering three phases in equilibrium, and therefore we get uh, uh, F equals zero. And F equals zero implies that out of those four variables, the temperature, the composition of uh, the two solid phases and the composition of the liquid, none of them can be chosen by you. Uh, it, everything is chosen for you by the system if you insist that the three phases must coexist in a binary system. And they're all sort of uh, uh, fixed here. And that's... Uh, the content of Gibbs phase rule, modified Gibbs phase rule for uh, for uh, this situation. OK, some quick uh, notes about uh, the uh, uh, solidification microstructures. If you take the eutectic alloy, as I said, uh, it uh, solidifies like a pure metal, but it produces at one temperature, but it produces um, uh, two phases. And the way the two phases appear in the microstructure is actually fairly interesting, and it appears in the form of these uh, lamellae. Lamellae is, uh, uh, is another technical term that we use. These are undulating or wavy sheets in 3D, uh, thin sheets, uh, but they are wavy. They are not flat plates, uh, though I mean some of uh, these features may appear to be flat, but these are wavy, as you can see in the uh, microstructure here. So uh, one set of eutectic uh, thingies uh, originated here, and they all grew uh, in the form of uh, these uh, wavy lamellae, and another set started somewhere else, and they grew in, a, in some other direction, etc. They are referred to as colonies. Um, that is not particularly important here, but as you can see, uh, the eutectic basically produces uh, this uh, stuff. And one, I mean, uh, how exactly it originates is something that is still uh, a matter of research. But once it is set up, it is very easy to see why it must be sustained. And if you set up the alpha and beta, alternating lamellae of alpha and beta, uh, you can see this quite nicely. Oh, by the way, this is, uh, we have subtly changed over to some other uh, eutectic system. Uh, this is a solder alloy in the lead tin system here. But it is basically the same thing as, as whatever you have uh, discussed. So this temperature is important in uh, microelectronics. So lead is bad news for microelectronics. And, but most solders are, uh, I mean, at least uh, some 20, 30 years ago, uh, the solders were all uh, lead tin solders. And since lead is bad news, um, there has uh, been a lot of effort to replace lead in solder materials. And one of the things that uh, they would want to do is to ensure that the temperature does not, the temperature at which the solder can operate does not change very much from this value. Um, because many of the equipment are designed for uh, uh, solder to work at uh, 
uh, this temperature. Anyway, that's just an aside. So let's quickly run through this. Alpha and beta. Alpha is uh, um, lead rich and beta is uh, tin rich. And uh, so here's a liquid and here's uh, the alternating lamellae that you have. And uh, since alpha is lead rich and from the liquid, uh, more of the lead should go that way to alpha and join alpha so that alpha can grow and more of tin should join beta so that uh, this beta can grow. And uh, so this alternating lamellae sort of help set up things in such a way that um, uh, this can happen quite readily uh, ahead of the um, solid liquid, this broad interface um, uh, that separates a solid, two-phase solid and, and the single-phase uh, liquid. So, uh, all right. The off eutectic alloy. So this should also be an off eutectic alloy here. Uh, again, I need to change this. I'll, I'll post a corrected version later. So uh, if you take an alloy with uh, something like 40%, then uh, again, on crossing the liquidus, you start forming the first solids of lead, uh, solid grains. And as you come down to lower and lower temperature, some liquid is uh, still left, and that liquid will eventually um, solidify in the form of uh, alternating lamellae, which is characteristic of uh, eutectics. You end up getting uh, this sort of microstructure. You get these big boulders of uh, the so-called the primary lead-rich phase, and uh, then uh, the region between these big boulders, huge boulders, uh, they uh, they contain the eutectic. Uh, microstructure, which is basically lamellar. There are other kinds of eutectic uh, microstructures that have been observed, but uh, in this course, we will sort of stop here. And uh, I will show you some interesting microstructures in one of the annexures later, but uh, so these are the things that I wanted to cover here. OK, so we are uh, done here. That took me about half an hour or so, so let's uh, Okay, are there any questions? Okay, before um, you ask me stuff about uh, quizzes and stuff, I need to talk to you about this. Last week, I could not uh, take the Tuesday's class. Uh, I'm sorry about uh, the rather late notice, but uh, something else came up uh, at that time, so I could not uh, take this class. And uh, we already missed one more class fairly early in the process, so we will have to do a couple of uh, makeup uh, sessions, so which we will do um, based on your convenience. But uh, I mean, the convenience of everybody is not really that important because right now we probably have about 30 students in the class now. And uh, since things are getting recorded, in principle, they have access to the class discussion. So because of that, um, anything that we choose, uh, which is rather convenient for uh, uh, most of you who are present here, would be fine with me. Um, and we will also do the quiz during the non-class hours because it is taking up uh, basically one full class hour since we still have some more stuff to cover. So we'll uh, uh, do the quizzes also during some non-class hours, uh, which basically means that every week we need uh, at least half an hour extra. What would be a good time? Saturday? Uh, or you have any other slot? Uh, so don't, don't we have a slot for... Uh, TA, uh, materials TA. And um, that's, uh, those are four different days. And uh, you have all been divided up into little groups and uh, it's, it's supposed to be for one for uh, each, each group. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So 
if any of you wants to meet the TAs, the TA duty is uh, is uh, pre-assigned. So um, you are welcome to consult the TAs on on things. But they are on four different days, and uh, I understand you have some lab sessions during those days. Different groups have lab sessions on different days. Oh, yeah, yes, sir, yes. Yeah, okay, so that good. that is the problem. So it will have to be either late in the evening, if you don't want your uh, sort of weekends. I don't know whether uh, uh, when you are sitting at home, whether weekends really matter to you or not. <laughs> but uh, if you want to save your weekends for other things, I mean, uh, we will just uh, spend uh, um, some time late evening um, for uh, another session. A week. Uh, sir, we do have these humanities like, like slots which are not being used because humanities lectures are completely recorded, pre-recorded. That's it. You don't yeah, have so we, any any live sessions with uh, the so-called instructor. I guess uh, these are all uh, um, recordings from various people. Yeah, these are the yeah, humanities. Sir, humanities. The entire time we only got three lectures, and we don't have any team or anything for it. We don't have any meeting, so just lectures okay. are sent to us. Sounds sounds wonderful. So. <laughs> Yeah, why don't we, why don't we make use of uh, the generosity of the humanities people? Hey, I'm not, I'm not intruding into into this. I'm, I'm only saying uh, that we will have only makeup sessions, so we need two makeup sessions, and this uh, quiz during the regular class hour uh, basically takes up the entire uh, class hour, even though the quiz itself is for 15 minutes. So I want to dispense with that. We still have five more quizzes and uh, which we will do starting from um, later this week. Um, so the next quiz will have uh, next to two quizzes will have phase diagrams as uh, the topic. I will send you some questions and uh, you can you can take a look at them and be prepared for the quiz. And I'll also post. I mean, last week I could not do it. This is the second week I'm giving you this exercise, uh, excuse. I'll, I'll post the topics for uh, the uh, uh, term papers as well. So I'll we'll take it up a little later. So, so, by so, tomorrow, so, I I will post it. By tomorrow's class, we can actually have a quick discussion about those topics as well, and what is expected in these quizzes. I mean, uh, uh, term papers. Yeah. Yes. Sir, uh, so uh, so confirm tomorrow we will have normal class and no quiz tomorrow. Normal class. Yeah. Normal class. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so when is this uh, humanities class that you guys are offering to me? So one is there today itself, 11 to 12. Jesus, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank then you. One is, uh, then one is in the 12 to 1 on Thursday. OK, let's uh, let's take up two classes uh, um, on Thursday. Those will be the makeup classes, OK? But this week's Thursday session, we will just use it for uh, um, the two quizzes. No, let's I'll, I'll give you time. I'll give you time. It's it's not fair. So let's uh, do the, the quiz uh, next Thursday. So we will have a regular session this uh, this Thursday. We'll start the new topic. That's OK. I still have some more stuff to be covered in, in uh, phase diagrams, which I will cover uh, tomorrow and we'll be done with it. Thursday, I'll start a new topic, but uh, the, the quiz itself, unless you are giving me a time slot, some other time slot, which is OK um, for the quiz, uh, either this weekend or uh, uh, next week. OK, coming back to today's uh, topics, I mean, any questions? OK, I don't see anybody uh, raising their hand, so we'll sort of uh, stop now. But uh, do go through the slides 
and uh, most of the things that are in bold, uh, they basically represent some jargon that you will need to know. Uh, things like eutectic, uh, tie line, uh, phase fraction, and you need to be able to do some simple calculations involving phase fractions and um, alloy compositions and so on. And uh, in other words, you need to be able to read a phase diagram and uh, arrive at some conclusions quickly. And uh, that's, uh, and of course, you also need to be able to uh, look at some of the consequences of the phase diagram. And uh, so there are still some more topics that are left over, so which we will cover uh, in tomorrow's lecture. Uh, otherwise, I mean, we'll, we'll stop now. Uh, I'll sort of linger for some time if anybody still wants to discuss something or the other, but if you need to leave for the next class, you're welcome to. Thank you, sir.